Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sir Franz, and our focus for this afternoon um, is immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins or antibodies serve as the foundation of a lot of concepts of prevention of disease. Um, it also serves a lot of therapeutic um, purposes, as we will discuss later in our course. So this is our topic outline. First, we will introduce antibodies. We will then take a deeper look into the structure of antibodies, as well as touch some concepts of immunoglobulin classes, clonal selection, and a little bit advanced uh, concept of immunoglobulin gene rearrangement. B lymphocytes produce immunoglobulins. Antibodies make up up to 20% of the total plasma protein. And plasma being the liquid component of blood upon which the blood elements are suspended. Immunoglobulins bind tightly to antigens. And we define an antigen as any molecule that induces the formation of a matching antibody. From the name itself, antigen, um, which stands for antibody generator. Antigens must fulfill two criteria. First, it has to be large, and the molecular weight is up to greater than 10,000 atomic mass units. And second, it has to be a foreign molecule with the exception of autoimmune diseases, where there is failure of self-tolerance and even antigens are the body's own, the body's own proteins. The formation of antigen antibody complex marks the antigen for destruction, where phagocytic cells selectively phagocytize antibody-coated pathogens. Antibodies are extremely diverse, and each person has greater than 1 million structurally different antibody, each with its own unique antigen binding specificity. So, how do antibodies function um, to provide specific immunity? Number one is complement activation, where it will stimulate the synthesis and secretion of complement, which are chemical mediators of immunity. And uh, like antibodies are plasma proteins. Next, they stimulate phagocytosis um, via the process of opsonization, which we have touched on a little a while ago. Second, antibodies induce histamine release from mast cells. And when histamine is released, it functions as a vasodilatory substance, increasing the permeability of capillaries by which white blood cells are able to exit the intravascular space and contact pathogens. Antibody structure. So an antibody consists of four disulfide bonded polypeptides. And that means the antibody is a protein, the basic unit of which are amino acids. So there are four of these chains, as you will see in this image. Two identical heavy chains marked in the image as red and two identical light chains marked in the image as blue. So all antibodies have the same general structure and the heavy chains usually have a weight of 53,000 atomic mass units and the light chains usually have a weight of 22,000 atomic mass units. And the general shape of an antibody is the letter Y by which each arm of the letter Y is formed by the amino terminal of the heavy chain and light chain polypeptides. 
So as you will observe in the image, the arms of the amino of the um, antibody um, consists of the amino terminal, which means for that very long polypeptide, the N or the amino N is oriented to the arm of the antibody. And um, this amino terminal confers the specificity and the ability of this antibody to bind and neutralize antigens. So, antibodies have domains. And um, when we talk of domains, we are focusing our attention on the arm of the Y structure of the antibody. So, the first domain is the variable domain. And this is found in the amino terminal of light and heavy chains, which means the distal portion of the polypeptide. Variable, variable domains are parts of the antibody that binds the antigen non-covalently. So this variable domain is what interacts with the antigen. Most of the variability is concentrated in hyper-variable regions. You might uh, surmise that there are different types of antigens and um, the specificity, the uniqueness of the antibody in binding these antigens is concentrated, focused on the variable domain, particularly the hypervariable region. And there are three hypervariable regions in the variable domain of the light chain, the blue one, and up to four hypervariable regions on the heavy chain, the red one. So the term hypervariable denotes that these portions of the antibody are able to create um, highly different structures and um, orders of amino acids so that they match the also highly different types of antigens. The constant domains um, of the heavy chain defines the class of the immunoglobulin. As you will observe in the image, the central shaft of the antibody, the middle structure, is composed entirely of the heavy chain marked red. And uh, this constant domain of the heavy chain will be able to tell us what kind of immunoglobulin this antibody is. Okay? There are two types of constant domains for a light chain, and that is uh, kappa and lambda. So let's take a quick look into the different types of antibodies. Immunoglobulin G, um, shorthanded as IgG, is the most abundant antibody. It is the only antibody that is able to cross the placenta, which means that IgG produced by the mother is able to cross the placenta and interact with um, the fluids of the fetus. It is the primary effector of chronic antibody-mediated immunity, which means that the long-standing protection from infection that we receive from prior infection or from vaccination is conferred, is given by immunoglobulin G. So highlighted in this image are the relative concentrations of immunoglobulin G. And we see that in the y-axis and on the x-axis, we see the age of the fetus or the conceptus in months. And you will note that the peak of IgG concentration is at birth, around nine months. And um, at this time, all of the IgG comes from the mother, okay? And as the child progressively ages outside, you know, when the child is born, 
in extrauterine life, that is also the start marked here in orange. That is also the start by which um, the infant will be able to synthesize its own IgG once it contacts vaccines and antigens from the environment. So the implication of this slide is that after the, uh, after the birth of the infant, the first few months, the infant is protected from infections by antibodies produced by the mother. Okay? And so um, the ability of the infant to um, protect itself from antigens that were not discovered by the mother's own immune system um, is very low um, in the first few months of uh, birth. The next class is immunoglobulin M, and this is a disulfide bonded pentamer. And you will see the disulfide bridge in this image as um, the blue link between um, the monomers or fragments. Um, it contains a small polypeptide, which is the J chain, and it is formed within one week of infection but returns to baseline after convalescence. So what this means is that immunoglobulin M is the first class of antibody synthesized during the first encounter with a pathogen. So once you are infected, the first class of antibodies produced would be immunoglobulin M. And once you recover, from the infection, the levels of immunoglobulin M will continuously go down. So that if you have recovered from the infection and um, you take uh, the plasma of a patient, you will not see immunoglobulin M. And you will see immunoglobulin G. And that process is what we call zero conversion. The next type, of antibody is immunoglobulin A. It is the most abundant immunoglobulin in external secretions such as the tears, saliva, bronchial mucus, intestinal and genitourinary secretions, and milk. It is synthesized in the submucosal lymphatic tissue, including the tonsils in the throat and pear patches in the intestine. Immunoglobulin M is secreted as a dimer with a J-chain and a secretory component. So highlighted in this image is how immunoglobulin A acquires its uh, secretory component, um, which is derived from the membrane receptor that triggers the transcytosis or the passing through of immunoglobulin A across the mucosa you need to understand that the cells, the plasma cells, are located in the submucosa, which is a layer deeper than the mucosa. So the immunoglobulin A that is secreted in this layer, the submucosa, will have to pass through the outermost layer, which is the mucosa. And as it passes through, it acquires its secretory component. Once it is secreted, it is already present in the bodily fluids. The next type would be immunoglobulin E. Um, the primary function of IgE is to mediate allergic reactions. It functions as an antigen receptor on the surface of mast cells. So just take a uh, uh, few moments to Look at this image where IgE is uh, present here in the mast cell as the receptor. And the binding of antigen to the surface IgE, which in this case is the receptor, induces the release of stored histamine. 
um, which is the process of degranulation. Adaptive responses are based on clonal selection. You have to realize and remember that there are two arms in the body's um, immune system, innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity is very specific towards a particular pathogen. It is very powerful and it has the ability to make memory, okay? While innate immunity is relatively non-specific and it is quick to act. So here our focus is the antibody's contribution to adaptive immunity. B lymphocytes deposit their antibodies in their plasma membranes as antigen receptors. So the um, B lymphocytes that are yet to be activated create antibodies and insert these antibodies into their cell membranes. Each B cell produces only one antibody. So that is the general relationship that one type of B cell will produce only one type of antibody. Thus, there will be millions of different kinds of B cells, each with specific antigen binding specificity because there are millions of kinds of antibodies. B cells become activated by antigen binding and by exposure to helper T cells. So to activate, to put the B cell into motion, it must be able to bind the antigen to which its antibody present in the receptor um, is specifically designed for. Plus, aside from binding of that antigen, it must be activated by a helper T cell. Only those specific B cells bound by antigens proliferate and turn into antibody secreting plasma cells. So after being bound and after being helped by T lymphocytes, these specific B cells now differentiate further into plasma cells which produce antibodies. And this process of selective proliferation is what we call clonal selection. Only those that are bound by specific antigens are the B cells which proliferate and differentiate. Okay? On top of plasma cells, B cells, once activated, will also produce memory cells. And this is the goal of vaccination, to produce memory cells so that whenever the organism encounters that pathogen the second time around, the immunity mounted will be quicker and at a greater magnitude, which will protect the organism from disease. The next concept is class switching. After antigen exposure, B cells change the surface antibody receptor from IgM originally into IgG. So those naive B cells, which have not yet encountered the antigen, express on their surface IgM. But once they are already activated, future um, B cells, when they proliferate from being activated, will now express IgG. The variable regions did not change. And the switch into IgG is mediated by a change in the constant domain from mu, which is the constant domain of the heavy chain of IgM into gamma, which is the constant domain 
of the heavy chain of IgG. So this is an illustration of the process I described a while ago. The premature B cell, which is um, present in bone marrow um, from stem cells, will go out of the bone marrow and hone into lympho, uh, lymphoid follicles or lymph nodes. Um, in the lymph nodes, uh, they express IgM okay, on their surface. Once that specific IgM, which will only notice a specific antigen, gets exposed to that antigen, the B cell is stimulated and activated together with helper T cells, which co-stimulate the B cell. So um, the next one, after activation, the B cell will proliferate and those daughter cells will then eventually become plasma cells, which have a different phenotype or a different form specialized for synthesizing proteins, which in this case are antibodies. And these antibodies are secreted into the fluids of the body, okay, the lymph, and then into the plasma. The next concept is genetic rearrangement. Um, for this, we have the question, how can humans make millions of different antibodies even though they only have 20,000 genes? And so um, the answer to that is genetic rearrangement. The antibodies are encoded by three gene clusters. One gene cluster for the kappa-like chain Okay, one gene cluster for the lambda light chain and one gene cluster for the heavy chain. The joining of these genes are imprecise. So whenever a B cell, which is still in the bone marrow, is trying to develop, it will continuously rearrange these three sets of genes so that their gene products, which will eventually be proteins after transcription and translation, are antibodies which have um, different orders of amino acids. And these differing amino acids will then be able to produce a three-dimensional shape that is specific for a particular antigen. And so it is by um, this mixing and matching of genes that the different antibodies are formed. Okay? Mutations are controlled selectively to produce varying antibody polypeptides that recognize specific antigens. Further mutations are introduced during class switching by cytidine deaminase. So whenever a particular antibody has already been expressed and there comes a time that these B cells would have to be activated, the IgM there expressed in the cell surface would have to be converted into IgG. And to convert into IgG, the enzyme cytidine deaminase, which is present in the nucleus, would continuously remove amino groups NH2 from cytidine. And this base, cytidine, once deaminated, transforms into thymine. Okay? So... Um, by the action of cytidine deaminase, there are point mutations that are created in the gene of this B cell. And that process is what we call somatic hypermutation. 
So here is an illustration of how genetic rearrangement occurs. In this gene, the first bar, um, you will see that there are three um, V genes. There are five J genes and one constant gene. During gene rearrangement, one of the V genes is randomly put together with a J gene. And so um, with this random combination, we will be able to produce random also uh, gene products. So here, Vx is spliced with J gene 3, 4, and 5. And that can be um, randomly combined such that it's not Vx, but Vn or V1, and not one and any of the five J genes. And so this putting together of the different genes randomly will create varying combinations of mRNA upon transcription. And also um, varying combinations of polypeptides uh, during translation. Okay, and so that's how antibodies um, are generated, you know, the different kinds and um, with uh, multiple and varying specificities. Okay. So this is my reference for this lecture. The reason for providing this lecture, uh, a crash course on antibodies is um, by next week during our asynchronous class, we will be uh, diving in into how monoclonal antibodies are created. Okay, so thank you for listening.